might just now, in very quick order, introduce your panel. Um, first up, <coughs> excuse me, um, Sue Camp, today is today. Uh, Sue, a hormone expert, nutritionist, uh, started working in Botswana or, or was working on developing wholesome meals for a safari camp. Um, went and opened a restaurant in Namibia, successfully sold it, relocated to the UK, where she um, embarked upon a further journey of nutritional therapy. A BSc and MSc in personalised nutrition and a certified practitioner at the Institute of Functional Medicine. And we don't charge for applause. <laughs> Very importantly, that Anola, um, she is a business owner too, and Anola, which is an acronym for online now, offline later, it will all make sense as you think it through, um, is all about the art of living naturally. So I describe it, if you will forgive me, um, as, I've got to be careful with the crowd, if Space NK and the School of Life met at Wilderness and had a baby. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a good way to describe it. Um, but it's all about, I'm very passionate about helping people make great decisions, positive decisions, about sustainable healthy choices for their own uh, health. So that is your panel. Um, I will hand over now to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. He's quite good, isn't he? He's not called the voice of God for nothing. <laughs> he, for the sports uh, fans in the room, might recognise the voice because he was uh, the voice um, at Wembley in Twickenham, I think. Um, and has done lots of warm-up for all sorts of things. You act, I'm surprised you haven't met him, Dominion, actually, because he used to do warm-up for TFI Friday. Oh, maybe back things. in the day. Yeah. <laughs> 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 maybe that's the blurry, that's the past life. Don't which commit we'll to an answer. Which will get to. There are no secrets in this room by the time I finish with you all. Um, and so I just wanted to welcome you all. And, you know, Ben is absolutely right. What Omnos are doing are democratising health. And I can say that after 30 years of scouring the planet, and as Andy mentioned, I was the editor of the Tatler Spa Guide, and I did try and democratise it. It's quite difficult at Condé Nast because they have a way of doing things. Um, but we did take it from the pampering element and the spoiling element to much more progressive, integrative health. But that came at a really big cost. And what really frustrated me, whether you're a millionaire or not, 
was A, going over to Switzerland and spending tens of thousands of pounds to, be honest with you, not find out any more than what's in these amazing boxes. And not only that, they didn't join the dots. So what the spa machine really does is it encourages you to go and spend a lot of money, get very paranoid, agree to everything they suggest, which is normally lots and lots and lots of supplements, and a return visit, and then you get home and you feel fantastic for about 48 hours and you're back to square one. <laughs> So that felt like I was a bit on a bit of a roundabout, a bit of a crazy carousel doing that. And um, wonderful those magazines are for inspiring people. It's really time, and I think the pandemic has probably accelerated the need for us to take health into our own hands, but people do need a little bit of holding hand in order to do that. So you guys are trading in transformation. Your roles are really important, and I have to say the state of mainstream media right now with, with health is a concern and as a journalist that's been writing for these publications for so long we really need you to start banging your drum about taking health into hands of our own because I'm, I'm I'm worried really about the narrative of health and how disempowering it's seeming at the moment and especially even with how we're talking about health right now it seems like it's doomed and it's a disaster and we can't do anything about it now I think everyone in this room knows that that's not true so it's a it's a it's a big deal and um, it's amazing to have you all here. The early adopters, I think you're called. <laughs> um, and the panel, of course, we wouldn't be able to move things forward without you. So I wanted to just go round, actually, and just get top line on why you're in this room today. What got you into wellness, Thomas? Let's start with you. Myself. So when I almost made to the Olympic, <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I actually um, realized that um, the impacts um, just nutrition had on my performance and I used to as a good French man after training I used to swim and I used to have a whole baguette with Nutella that was just two hours before dinner but because I used to swim so much it just you know was really angry all the time and um, but realized that the day after I was just KO and I thought at the beginning it's just I'm training too much but realized that as soon as I dropped this uh, things were starting, I didn't have those sugar crush anymore and still was, things are starting to, to, to get a bit better. And I started experimenting with all the things and started to, mm. back in the days, the first men's health uh, and nutrition and really got interested into uh, nutrition uh, and how I could improve my performance. And then I got the passion of improving other people's performance when I didn't make it to the Olympic and I, just, I had to stop. <laughs> um, so yes, so this is how I started really. So to shake the Nutella baguettes. Yeah, to shake okay. the Nutella baguettes. Do you ever have the, the occasional one now? Or? No, holidays not anymore. No. Not, not worth anymore. it. Okay. Not worth it, no. No, brilliant. Well, you are, you are the poster boy for uh, good health, I have to say. Um, and Sue, tell us what's brought you here into the field of wellness and why you're here today. Um, I had a girlfriend who addressed her depression with food, lifestyle and, and nutritional support and it was so inspiring to me. I come from Southern Africa, um, I was in Vintuk in Namibia, it was a society of red meat and potatoes on one hand and for a very third world population it was a very processed food of processed foods and grains and sugars and I watched the, the, uh, the effects of that kind of eating on both very different uh, population groups but both um, suffering from that kind of way of eating. So we opened up a, we, we opened up a, a restaurant and catering business called Fresh and Wild. Yes, we did steal the name from Whole Foods at that stage. <laughs> 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 we didn't think we were, we didn't have global plans at that stage. And was that to, for the community or? It, so it was yeah, so it was, we uh, had a restaurant, um, but we also had a catering business where we, uh, Vintuk was small enough city that we could drive across town at lunchtime. So people would email their orders and we changed the menu every day. We wanted to be seasonal and local and fresh and we delivered food on the desks of office workers around wow. Vintuk. So it was just trying to, what can we do with food, real food? You brought that that authenticity and that passion to your practice here Exactly, in so I, the kitchen is hard work and by these six years in the kitchen I wanted to get out of the kitchen and into the nutritional side of health and the application of the nutritional science. Wonderful. So I left Southern Africa and came to, to study in the UK. And Hopefully brought those cortisol levels down, maybe the genes <laughs> have exactly. shown more <laughs> Exactly. Thank you Sue. And Christian? Uh, well, uh, as most people's stories, mine has a lot of nuance to it, so I'll try to keep it as uh, concise as possible. I'm going to start interrupting yeah. shortly. Oh, good, good. <laughs> right, but yes, as you heard, I was a former world champion kickboxer um, and did, was doing everything right. 
I was training all the time. I was eating the right foods. I was getting my sleep. I was atypically what everyone would tell you to do is right. I was doing it. Yet, year after year, I was getting sicker and sicker. I was falling apart, and no one could understand why. In fact, I went to many like the doctors, health practitioners, and people either would tell me, it's in my head, I was training too hard, wasn't eating enough, I uh, wasn't sleeping enough, or that they would, they would have this particular gold standard thing that would fix me and that's my problem. But what no one ever actually did was look at me as an individual and figure out what was going on and what my story actually was. And this experience of my own, going through, fig finally figuring out what the problems was, getting the solutions, brought me to uh, a particular phrase that I use very regularly, which is test, don't guess. And the fact is, if you don't understand what the personal journey, where you sit on that map, and what direction <coughs> you need to travel, then you're just literally sticking your finger in the air and taking a wild guess. And this is what drives me in this current environment. It drives me in my profession and everything that I'm doing here with Omnos. Good. On a mission. Yes. On right. a mission. Yeah. Where okay, should we start? Well, just following on from what you said, uh, the test, don't guess, really resonates with me. So my mother got breast cancer. She had it when she was 27, so she was always on the watch list anyway. So I always saw, uh, we were always aware that she had to go for mammograms and things. And then when she turned 58, I was pregnant with my third child, and uh, it came back. And we went through the normal procedure. She went back to the same hospital in Manchester where she was treated because she felt safe there. And they did the one-size-fits-all approach. This chemo works for most people, it should work for you. Inevitably, it didn't. And uh, we were told to put her affairs in order, but a neighbor of mine, I was living in London at the time, said, you wanna try this clinic in Germany? And I thought, you know, what have we got to lose? So we went over to Germany. And there I saw what they did, bearing in mind this was eight years ago, they took a sample of the tumor, took its DNA, and they targeted it. They targeted it and they shrunk it. So she, she beat the cancer long enough to see me give birth to my child. Fast forward a few years, that resonated with me, the whole targeted approach, the DNA, the fact that things have their own sort of like identity and can be attacked or they can be diminished or they can thrive through certain protocols. It just stuck with me. So after having yet another child, yes, I am very fertile. Uh, so <laughs> after I'd had number four, I was, I was in a bit of a slump probably hormones, the usual, you know, heading for middle age, and I couldn't shift the weight. So that's when I turned to DNA, and I, I tried a DNA test. I thought, you know, let, let's see what, what this is about because I'm a recovering alcoholic as well, and I don't have any trauma. I had a decent childhood, you know, there, there's nothing I could sort of isolate to see this is why I drink. And then when I started looking at my dopamine pathways and, you know, the way I can detox alcohol, all of a sudden this burden was lifted off my shoulders, and I'm like, Okay, so I'm not indulgent. It's just a perfect storm. I partied in the 90s. There was excess. I love dopamine. And guess what? I can detox. I've got Irish blood, for God's sake. So, so you can detox. So, very well. So really very bad. well. Really I can bad. drink and drink We would have had drink. a terrible night out, though. Yeah, yeah. Been yeah. Off she goes. After two drinks. <laughs> so <laughs> for me, it was all about targeting. And leading on from this, I think it is the future of health. And we all need access to it. Otherwise, you're guessing. Absolutely. And I think, well, there's a combination, isn't there? Because when your mum was going through her illness, was there, did she, did she have any sort of trust or, or knowledge about what she felt she needed to be doing about her health care? Because I do think there is a combination, isn't there, of getting really great tests, but also empowering yourself to tune in and work out maybe what else you need. Did you, was there any of that going on or was it very much, mm. I've outsourced my health care, I will do what the doctors say, and hopefully it'll be fine. Now, obviously, really sadly, it wasn't, but did the German clinic help her in any way with that? Or was it just, no, my, I do not own my healthcare, someone else owns it? Yeah, I mean, of, of course, we're talking nearly a decade ago, there was no sort of like input. And also she's very scared because last time they'd saved her. So of course, all the trust there, because we don't have that education. We don't understand how our body works. We literally leave it to the experts and that's it. There's no responsibility and there's no interest. It's just based around fear. Absolutely. And I think, and I, I totally agree from, you know, for me, the very top line, I got into well-being because I grew up in a family where 
they didn't look after themselves and I don't think they had a very good genetic profile. You know, my dear old dad, <coughs> I th don't think he did really much more than his counterparts did. I just think if he'd had this done 20, 30 years ago, he probably would have lived things, you know, lived life differently. So it's a bit unfair, actually. He um, parted no more, no less than the rest of them, but didn't fare so well. But back then, it was absolutely, you know, that the, the, the whole thing of, you know, it's the health care doesn't belong to me. I will do what I'm told. And we've been through, you know, I have been um, marched into various offices of various hospitals around London, um, you know, because they don't want a shaman or a masseuse or a, you know, physio in the ward because yeah. they won't do that themselves. So I will bring people in that will do it. And I've done that with various relatives. Um, and it's this, this not owning not owning. Why do you think that's happening, Sue? Is it just the narrative? Is it uh, the way we've been brought up? Because this room full of people seem to be able to understand that it's our ownership. So why can't 99.9% .9 of people... I think it's a generational thing. Um, and I think it's an education thing. And I think it's a paradigm of germ drug um, theory. So I don't understand the germs. Only the doctors understand the germs. The doctors understand the drugs. Germ equals drug, therefore it's their information. And I think in the time of your mum and when she was growing up, it was white coats, you know, and everybody bowed down to the theories of their doctors. And now through information and the internet and further testing and for developing of research, we have the information and we can start doing our own research and empowering. So I think there's a real shift. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think there's probably a few steps back as well about um, self-worth. Yeah. You know, I'm worth yeah. feeling well, I'm yeah. worth feeling better. And I think a lot of people do get trapped in that, um, well, there's nothing I can do. And my doctor won't join the dots between my diet and, you know, they won't, the nutritionist isn't talking to the person doing, you know, <laughs> other body work or, um, you know, how, how does that happen? You know, and the, is, it, is it a cost? Is it purely cost or is it just a different system? And are we going to, are, do you think we're able to change that system slowly? Or do you think it's going to be too late in our time and we've just got to do it no, for ourselves? I mean, the fact that we're here tonight is evidence that there's change afoot. It's never too late for anything. And I think it's, it's about taking back ownership. And, and the change of this mindset is actually now happening where we understand, OK, we've been reactive for too long and believe in a system, which is an amazing system if you break down, as we explained earlier. So you get hit by your car, you have amazing doctors that will save your life. But when it comes to multifactorial disease, that things that are not linear, it's not working. It's not the right system. We're in a system that is about prevention, about education, and things that put you at the center of it. So actually, you're engaged and you take back this ownership. So you're proactive towards it. And this is what we want to offer. And, and, and this is why we should all take back this ownership towards our health. Um, without creating this inner relationship with your own body, by understanding where you come from. For example, a genetic test is an amazing discovery. When I understood about this baguette thing, because I've got all those type 2 diabetes genes, so obviously, we, yes, I'm going to crash. And I could have carried on that and maybe become type 2 diabetes without knowing. And the problem is, is not knowing. I mean, I probably could have told you quite quickly it was the baguette and Nutella, but you know, it, it's the knowing you know, for most people, especially when it comes to menopause and hormones or you know, men with heart disease, you know, what are those factors that are going to be the alarm bells for someone? Is it exactly. stress for someone that's going to be a real issue and they need to get on it? Or is it dietary, which they need? And of course, it's a combination but certainly for some people it's trying to find that needle in the haystack which is hard yeah. and and Thomas what's um just to follow on briefly without giving us um the elevator pitch what's happened since the pandemic in terms of what people are looking for what has added to you know what are they coming to Omnos for at the moment to, I, I think to it's, it's for you? the solution of how to be in control because now we know you is know, the pandemic the mental, is a wake-up call. Do you mean the call. mental point of view? Is it weight yes, loss? The, is the it mindset, mental health? The, the, the mindset of, okay, um, now, yes, we can, we're quite, you know, vulnerable. And it's good to be reminded, reminded sometimes how vulnerable you are because you can then, okay, be a bit more proactive. You're like, okay, I need to take, you know, things back in control here. Um, and, yeah, just realizing the fact that actually the, most of people who had the issue were really metabolically had metabolic issue but sometimes you can do something about that you, you can you know fix this um, it's obviously you have predisposition even genetic predisposition so you, but all those things combined gives you information to maybe do better um, and prevent the worst case scenario if you can sure and um, I suppose getting to the nub of it though do you have you seen a spike in 
the mental side of health post-pandemic? And awesome. is that a confusing uh, story to try and unravel? Because I think people are just about getting their head around that maybe looking at my genes, type two diabetes, weight, you know, um, what diet maybe I should be on. But when it comes to depression, anxiety, you do have a predisposition to also suffering those things, yeah. is that right? You have a predisposition to all those things. So I have the COM genes, for example, is one of those genes where you can be, like we call the, the, the warrior genes, right? And I had the- Warrior or warrior? Warrior or war warrior. If you have certain, yeah, okay, actually. Um, I'd like to have the war warrior genes. But also, warriors. you know, like the, the isolation we went through, all those different things is just being disconnected from your natural environment. So also reminding the fundamentals, right? So. Some people might be wondering, why is he wearing these crazy glasses? <laughs> I was just going to get to it that It's because of the light, which is not mm. natural, right? Yeah. And maybe if this natural light will prevent us to go to sleep. So it will actually raise the cortisol and prevent melatonin that induces into sleep. So all those different things that we have been disconnected from being in isolation make things a lot worse if you're predisposed to anxiety, for example, because you're not align with your environment, you know, um, and those fundamentals are also very important. Obviously, we do the, the testing, but you have to, to get with the fundamentals. No, first absolutely. As well. And um, I'm glad you pointed out the glasses, <laughs> just for anyone that hadn't noticed. So rose tinted glasses. No, you take it to like red rose tinted glasses. So um, and Thomas has just uh, nicely nutshelled why you're wearing those. Do you wear them all day? No, no. on and off uh, uh, sunset. Okay. So basically, when the sun sets, I put these on. Hence why I wasn't wearing them earlier. You may recognise I was just there on yeah. my chest earlier yeah. in the in the sort of day it, when everyone was coming in. I thought you know how Keith Lemon's got a bandage on his hand. <laughs> I thought that was your version. <laughs> so, so it's very cool. You suit them too. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's simple, simple things like there was an amazing study. This one was done in rats, particularly. There's been plenty of human studies showing the effects of blue light on humans and also the effect of blocking them and how that stimulates extra melatonin. Red light, the red tinted glasses, particularly to block the blue and the green yeah. spectrum for that. But the study on rats were actually showing how. Blue light is connected to the sympathetic nervous system, so like your fight or flight response, the stress response that you'll get, and how that's connected to your liver. And they were showing that uh, extreme excess could actually stimulate carcinomas in the liver of rats. Now, it's not a human study. That doesn't mean you're going to get a carcinoma in your liver because you're not wearing red glasses. The rats have to wear little red glasses no. to see if it works. <laughs> it, was more, it was more about the blue light stimulation than it was the red glasses. It wasn't red glasses stopped them getting carcinomas in the liver. Uh, it was a little bit different, but it's still relevant. The most relevant thing is, is looking at how blue light in the, in the evening, or the, for them it was in the day, because they, they're technically having the wrong, uh, the different uh, dineural system, so a different body clock, but having that artificial light at the wrong point in time was causing a massive stress response in the system and stress does very directly impact the liver it's a very very strong impact so yeah. if you have predispositions within liver health and you know you have a very nocturnal artificial light lifestyle you may be hitting yourself in two ways yeah. that may be like Ex ex can you imagine you're always though. wearing red glasses, Dominia? Well, I, d I do try with one. Yeah. And do I you? Do. Yeah, 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 definitely. Because he finds it really difficult to go to sleep and I don't want to give him melatonin all no. the time because I've got four boys and they've all got different sort of circadian rhythms. Yeah. Um, my eldest in particular is a complete night owl and of course his school's at eight mm. o'clock. So I really struggle. I, I mean, I've actually got some that are clear yeah. that do block. He's 14, of course he's on his phone, you know, it's yeah. like trying to tear a tattoo Absolutely. off him, you know. Absolutely. But I put, I put the clear ones on him to see if I can mitigate it. Does he, so, like, a, does he like baths? Oh, yeah, he's 14, he's like, Mom, does he get seriously. No, but just, does he like being in the bathroom with the door shut? No, oh, well, yeah, see. So but no, seriously, the spike of, of temperature and then the lower of temperature yeah. is a very natural way of getting the serotonin spike. I well. do that every night. I sit in, I've got one of these, like, pop-up sauna things. I look like a Dalek, I look like a maniac. And I, I don't care what anyone says, I love Netflix. So I'll sit there, sometimes with blue blocking glasses on, and I'll sit there for 25 minutes, sweat, and then I'll get in a cold shower, and then I'll sleep. Meanwhile, my, my husband's looking at me like, did I really marry this Sexy. lunatic? <laughs> but I need my sleep and I want deep sleep. And of course, Aura Ring tells me it works. So I'm yes. sold on the whole yes. hot, cold sort of well, life I've, stress. I have been found outside, well not found, I've been spotted outside my front door and it's um, deepish garden, but there's people I know walk past occasionally because there's a park at the end of the road. And I have been spotted with a mud mask on, quite pink from a really hot bath <laughs> in my robe outside. 
but you know, needs must, right? Before you I'm get arrested. <laughs> um, so, um, no, in fact, they didn't notice, which worried me even more. Um, <laughs> so, no, so, and look, you are with, you know, you've got um, an amazing book that's a bestseller. Um, and again, having reviewed lots of books over the years and starting to realize, am I just peddling more neurosis here with all these um, books that people bring out? But it's not a diet book. And it's, you know, you not only lost weight, but you kept it off, which I think is, is the testament of things working when you can sustain what you've, to a good point. But you are, with your big following on Instagram, you probably get um, a lot of honesty out of people. So yeah. what do you think since pandemic, what issues are they dealing with that they weren't dealing with before or what's got worse? Wine, 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 wine. Everybody's really struggling with wine, motivation, sugar addiction. You know, it's the usual suspects, but they've literally, come up tenfold. I think because people have been out of their routine and you know that there's like being at home with boredom, a lot of time to reflect, stress, fear, and we've all turned to our usual crutches, you know, wine, sugar, and you know, it's just imploded and a lot of people's mental health. And that's the feedback I'm getting. So I, I'm like, okay, let's deal with this in a way. We need to replace something. We need to stop these cravings. And I found for me just switching things around, doing protocols like cold, shocking the system, you know, getting out into nature, increasing fats in your diet in the morning, your intermittent fasting, all these little sort of tiny, tiny bits just really add up to something that mitigate those cravings because people are just relying on these artificial stimuli constantly and they're just operating at a lower level and I've been there I know it I know what it's like yeah. when you want a croissant or a glass of wine in the morning bloody hell it's the same thing you know you're doing it to not make yourself like you know drunk you just want to feel normal yeah because we're all operating at a sub a very sub level but you you know you had to go through a massive crisis to get out of that you know you know what, what are we, I mean, what, where are we going to get to next for the majority of people? And I'll ask that to you, Sue, with your dealing with them in your practice. When, um, when people come in and they are almost crawling on their hands and knees to get to you, where do you, what is the first thing that you're, what was the first thing you'd recommend or the first two or three things to get them to even function so they can even do a test, change their diet? Because that mental block is huge, isn't it? Yeah, it's so true. And I, one, it's, you've got to meet them where they're at, and it's baby steps. It's whatever they can do. And all of those things that, that Davinia has just mentioned are brilliant. So is it earlier sleep? Is it staying off the alcohol? And sometimes I say to clients, three or four nights a week, can we do it? If we can't do it, then sometimes I suggest, well, let's do a whole like month without alcohol and then add it back in. Because then they feel like they're getting something back in. Oh, I can, now I can drink three nights a week, whereas taking it out was harder. So it's kind of a reverse psychology. Is it about rubbing feet on the grass, getting out? It's yeah. whatever baby steps that they can manage. And for everybody, it's different. And how, um, how open are they to that? Because I know certainly, and I'm, you know, not going to rubbish mainstream media totally all night and get political, let's not do that. But um, you know, if I write an article on complementary medicine and the relationship between science and nature, integrated, progressive, which actually the good, the good clinics in Germany and Switzerland are very good at doing, um, it always has that slight edge of woo-woo, <laughs> so woo isn't she? Let's get Suzanne to do that because she loves a bit of woo-woo. And it's kind of, well, I've just actually substantiated everything I've written about. And you've taken it out mm -hmm. and you've made a really silly headline to make me look as if I am round the bend. Now, I am no, a little bit, but that's fine. We all are. But that's the bit I'm up against with the writing for, you know, large audiences. So when your audience come in, are they, I don't want to walk barefoot on the grass or I don't want to drink two litres of water a day. Are they, are they getting more open, do you think, to more, let's call it complementary medicine? Yeah, absolutely. And I think then it goes to what Christian says as test, because there's nothing more powerful than results on paper mm. to help people start shifting. Mm. And there's a range of tests, you know, it's not only the standard blood test from the GP, there's a range of functional testing and we see them here. Um, and the blood, t the finger prick tests that Omnas are bringing out are going to be hugely powerful. You know, it's a real, this is what your physiology is saying. This is what Here your cortisol is saying. Here's your melatonin. Yeah. You know, do you understand? Do you know? So that they know that it's not all in their head. It yeah. is their physiology. Yeah, I have to say, and I, we laugh about the um, detox pathways, very bad phase one and two. And I mean, <laughs> I can, if somebody was to put, you know, those, I'm sorry if anyone uses them, you know, those bounce or whatever they're called, you put in a tumble dryer to make your clothes smell nice. Mm -hmm. Anyone on my street uses one of those, I wake up and I'm 
<laughs> someone's using a bounce. I get, I mean, it's headache, you know, I get, and, and I, I think, and certainly with the horrific ha hangovers and just um, having two glasses of wine and going, why do I feel this is ridiculous? And you then blame it on your life. You think it's circumstantial. You think it's because you're not, um, why am I not coping with stuff? And then you do, you see it and go, oh, great. Now I've got a really good yeah. reason to tell people. And, and you know, do, did you find, Davinia, with getting some of those fat into black and white that could really help with you going well, I'm not doing that anymore or I can't cope with that well, um, it, I mean basically the, the, the old saying knowledge is power it really is but it's your own power because you have something tangible to argue with yourself you say look this is not right for me I mean you can have people advise you have two glasses of wine a night you can do it's just not right for me and I understand that and now I can I've had it in black and white through Omnus I understand what I should avoid. But I can also now navigate it myself on how I feel. I've become my own sort of black and white paper. I know if I have vegetable oil, I'll feel a dip within 15 minutes. And it just happens to me. I feel miserable and I feel like I need to eat sugar. And it's, that's just how I am. And I understand that. I know if I take one bite of that, I'm going to feel pissed off in a bit. And is it, and worth, the, it? Is it worth it? No. I don't want to feel hungover because I'm not even yeah. drunk in the first place. So yeah, where's exactly. the payoff? Exactly. You know? Exactly. And, and Christian, on, uh, what did you, when you thought, what did you discover that was a massive surprise when you started to go into the testing and the metabolic and what was a, a revelation for you? I, I mean, uh, the, the further I went in, the more revelations were that, that sort of came out of this. But um, a huge thing uh, when I started to research how various cofactors and enzymes actually functioned. Like, for example, I had a particular um, n excess need for selenium and B6. Now, selenium was one thing around like the oxidation of fats, and that was why, you know, if I have like uh, pork belly that's like cooked really, really badly, like you know, the burnt to a crisp, and I tried to eat something like that, or like or, or cooked in really high pressures or high temperatures, I can actually feel like stomach pains quite quickly from it because the oxidation of those fats. But more importantly, the B6 that relates to the glutathione production, your transamination, so the how you a lot of processes that happen in the liver. We're all revolving around that cofactor. And not having enough of that was basically making me super susceptible to chemicals. Like you talk about the bounce thing, that when you are that susceptible, like if someone walks in with perfume and you're like, oh God, yeah, and you start your headaches, you like your brain fog, you're like, oh God. Yeah. I would walk into like a, a corner shop with my now wife, like so, and then they'd be using like a bleach on the floor or something, and suddenly I'd be like, what? yeah. like what's wrong with you? What's, what happened? <laughs> You know, you were fine. You were joking about it a minute ago, and that next thing, and I'm like, that pff, gone because I had no resources, no capacity to deal with those issues. But once I actually started to manage those things properly, increase intake of specific nutrients, specific mm. things to support those systems specifically for me in my personal situation, then that robustness came back. That that capacity, the resources I needed to deal with those things were there, and I was then able to live life at a very fast pace rate. I mean, when I was fighting, I could barely read an A4 piece of paper without falling asleep. Now I read like a uh, you know, number of scientific papers a day. Yeah. You know? And it's I think that's what's super exciting, isn't it? It's not just saying there's an issue. Oh, that's not great. It's then, and I think what I was impressed as well with um, early on finding out, and um, Sam actually, who I had conversations with, and I know I met you at Bingham, a lovely hotel, but we had, I was quite cynical because of all these very expensive tests that sent people into what I felt was a bit of a sort of induced neurosis. Um, if you can't really do much about that, I don't no. see why to tell people they've got X and Y, Z issues, you know, unless you can actually do something about it and, and make it easy for them and, and these marginal gains. Um, and I love the fact that it was things like diet first, lifestyle, because also the, the very fancy spas, some of which were wonderful, by the way, I just want to make that clear, um, and do a lot of <laughs> incredible work, especially the, the smaller authentic retreats. They, they really do um, integrate things really wonderfully. And as I said, Germany and Switzerland, they are, they've got some incredible progressive medicine going on. But do you, um, it, it wasn't then having to buy lots and lots of supplements because we do need to start with the diet, would you say? Yeah. Or are we, is food just well, now not good enough? We do need to top up because the soil's, yeah. you know, parched. Again, and it's, it's based on where you are now and what do you need now, right? So it's, again, this un uniqueness of you, where you are now, and what is necessary for you to get better. Um, and the test will tell you exactly what it is. So then you have a very targeted 
intervention protocol, if you wish. And sometimes it's not supplements, right? Um, and also we talk about B6, so, but B6 or B12, like say for B12 for me, I have the same issue. And I must, I'm, I'm, you know, some people will be a bit uh, put off by this, but uh, B12, the best source is uh, organ meat. And I had organ meat today because I know I'm low in B12. Um, and that's the best solution for me. Then the supplements come after. So yes, diet first, the fundamental first um, is very important. But trying to always implement those things that count for you can make a massive difference, right? Um, and, and Christian tapped on this, uh, the, the toxin element. For me, it was the same, the glutathione, which is help removing all those toxins really low. And being in London, I was living near to, um, to uh, a motorway. Um, and I had those brain fog crazy. Um, as soon as I moved out, when I see from uh, my own viral toxin, but my car toxins were way too high, I moved out. And, you know, within weeks of doing things, uh, saunas and, and really going into supporting my detoxification pathways. I'm saying supporting, not detoxing, mm -hmm. right? It's very mm -hmm. important. Um, things started to change very quickly. And yes, I could also read books without feeling asleep. I could go in a tube without feeling completely, you know, asleep because I had this burden already of toxins in my body. So things were starting to change. And um, I'm going to go around and ask all of you this so you can think about your nutshell. Cause <laughs> I think given the time and I want to get to Q&As, I'd like, but there's a, there's a couple of more questions I want to ask you all, so if we can um, nutshell them now. But um, how would you like to see the democratisation of what you're doing? I mean, I know you've got plans. And by the way, if you do a good marital box, I think that will sell really well. <laughs> if, um, you've got genes for a good marriage. Um, so maybe it's in the pipeline. I'm looking forward to that. Um, but it's what's, how, how do you see this? Because I, I have a passion as well, and I know we spoke about this, and, and Devin, you're doing a great job, and I mean, everyone here is, but it's how do we make it affordable, accessible, acceptable? Please. To, you know, from teenagers, from, you know, how do we do that? You need to prove the concept, right? Um, and now already we're having a lot of people changing their lifestyle and already seeing symptoms disappearing and feeling better. And once you start proving the concept, let's say you have 10,000, 20,000 uh, people using this and preventing disease, right? So let's say type 2 diabetes, which costs a lot of money to the NHS. Uh, and most of those diseases, 70% of the budget goes in the 30% of you know, those diseases that uh, are totally preventable. So we really want to educate people in taking ownership on, on this. And by then proving the concept to, hey, Mr. NHS, or Mrs. NHS, um, you know, we are actually able to save you that amount of money. Um, and then this is where you prove a concept and you're able to get grants and maybe put the price down because yes those tests some of the tests are very expensive because they have to go to the US and come back from the lab and all those yeah, different yeah, things and, and there's so many people I don't know in how between. you make them so affordable but we're going to that another but, time. But, uh, but yes once you prove the concept then it, it's all about really going into you know changing the legislative and the, 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 the mindset um, and help trying to prove that we can actually solve a big problem, which is a massive problem for any country, because the, the health system, the healthcare system Boxing. for any country yeah. puts everybody down in their knee in a couple of decades. Absolutely, but I don't know, is he being idealistic? Is, do you think it's a, something I'm that the NHS... I'm an optimist, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> do you think the it's NHS here. who do really trade in illness and unwellness. Do you think it's something that can be changed or do you think it needs to be a whole new, I mean, I don't know, could people sponsor people that can't afford the kits or, you know, is there other, do you think there are other, I'm what would be your dream blue sky thinking to? Yeah, I, I mean, I think behind the NHS is a drug pharmaceutical agenda which is driving it i hesitate I to add that, that. <laughs> but, don't so, do it, but do it. exactly <laughs> it. but i think it's going to come bottom up and i think you know which is what we're all doing here today and i think there's an education and people asking questions and and as as ben was saying nhs is great for acute medicine if you've broken a leg we want to be there but it's not great for type 2 diabetes and cancer and 
um, and the whole realm. And so my doctor can't help me. So then what is my next port of call? And it's not cheap, is it? No. You know, and once you also get on the functional medicine, well, you know, exactly. and, and it shouldn't be because what you do is amazing. But And it's funny, people say, I can't afford that. Mm, how much did you spend on cheap wine from you know, waitresses? Yeah, there is that. You know, you know, sorry. You know. Uh, but so there's the, but it's, 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 the, it's the affordability, isn't it? Because by it, you, you do open a can of worms yeah. when you start looking. Exactly. And, um, and I think the group programs and the online programs are, are a way to do it. There's a lot of online programs out there, and they're very affordable. Yeah. Low-carb programs set up by an NHS GP. Dr. David Unwin, they've, and he's turned, I was listening to him, he's turned around 105 diabetics, reverse type 2 diabetes, and his little practice in Stockport, yeah. saving 60,000 pounds. I have a similar everything. project even for dementia, right? Yeah. So Dial Brinsden with, uh, exactly. you know, th exactly. there's many things proven to reverse dementia just by lifestyle intervention and diet inter intervention. I th yeah, I just think and we need to work on the mindset a little bit more than we are. I just, it's I just really think it's the mindset because it's also this, you know, system as we mm. mentioned it. I didn't mm. mention it, but yeah, pharma, for example, is really about what do we do with this little molecule here, where it's not a linear thing; it's multifactorial. What are all the other things when you come to dementia, for example, insulin sensitivity, mm. toxins? Mm. Yeah. They're not taken mm. into consideration, mm. and yeah. that's a shame. We just look for the holy grail, the, the mm. fixing pill, yeah. but it doesn't exist really. Mm. So <laughs> we're not going to mushrooms. Go I think they're pretty good at everything anyway. <laughs> Conversation, <laughs> 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 in all forms, we like them. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> sorry, that really put me off my train of thought. Talking about mushrooms, <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at rail. Um, so, um, but what would like your legacy to be? To make more people more healthy and happy before you? Uh, visibility. Right. Visibility is the biggest problem I find most people have, and it's that visibility and comes with that clarity of knowing what to do, what the first step is, what the second step is, what the third step is. The reason why we are all subject to this massive inertia, even the NHS's ability to help within the preventative medicine field, it's this inertia of just absolute fog, no clarity whatsoever on what step one is, let alone step two or three. So how do you expect them to even attempt to help? They're doing their best to do emergency medicine, that's what they're good at, but they don't have the resources, the time, anything to go into the preventative world. Now, yes, bottom up, I think, is going to be a big way that preventative health is going to come up and, you know, insurance companies are going to get on board and everything else. But until we get enough people with the right visibility, the right clarity to create the validation of these processes, to bring these proper whole scale uh, governing bodies on board with this approach, it's not going to become global or into any sort of larger sense. So first, we've got to get the visibility and clarity to the individuals to then build the validation of the system mm -hmm. to allow it to become something that can be adopted, not on a national scale, but on a global scale. And make it that it's not just for wealthy people with lots of money. Yes. Um, yes. Which that message that's, needs to yeah. get put across. That's the numbers game, right, yeah. that comes with it. So Absolutely. once we have those numbers going through, well, suddenly, if you have 100,000 people buying a test, that price can come right down yeah. because we can become economies of scale. Mm -hmm. I think we should gift tests this Christmas. Gift tests, <laughs> buy them yeah. for Christmas. Um, Davinia, what do you? What's? Um, I mean, you're do you, you're out there. I mean, you really are out I there. I mean, I, I often um, come up, up against that it's too expensive for me, and I love the business model. Whereas, you can generate income from your data because we're a data-driven planet. It's. I mean, data is so valuable, and if you can look at this as an investment on a twofold financial investment you get money back from your data and also as a health opportunity and then your insurance premiums go down there's a business model to be worked there so every mm. single person is born they have a dna test they know the risk factors and they start earning Boom. yeah yes <laughs> yeah, and it's a very interesting point because yes you need to have this data ownership and something we're very really strong at because it's one of the fastest growing commodity is your health <coughs> data yeah and and that's why you need to get ownership back of it because it's something later you can trade. And that can be also very useful for the collective learning, right? Whether you want to opt in or not, and it has to be your choice. But it could be used for the collective learning of, okay, well, let's say King's College is looking for someone with these genes and those different things because they want to do this study. And then there's also all the other technologies that are now available, mach machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, but you can connect the dots between things and actually do simulation on things and, and learn a lot from this. But you need to have all those data in one place to do that. 
and that's why it's important to contribute to all this. Um, yeah. yeah. Totally. Okay, just a very, I've got one, okay, I'm going to do the last question and it's going to be fast. I want to know all of your non-negotiables, your health non-negotiables, your three things that you do every day without fail. I mean, you don't need to go into too much detail, obviously, <laughs> um, not, not the basic basic. So, um, I'm going to start with you. Um, a sauna. Mm -hmm. Sauna and cold, yeah, cold shower, as, as often as I possibly can, yeah. Okay. Yeah, non-negotiable. It's my hormones, they will ruin my life. We need to do so we need to a yeah. whole separate one on. Hormones are brutal. We need at least three hours. Um, the last, and right? lots of air conditioning. Um, okay, one more. That was two. Sauna um, and cold and third. I avoid uh, veg oil, seed oils. Okay. Yeah. Seed or, oils? Yeah, like sunflower seed oils and rape seed oils. The they just don't matter. go in my. For the inflammation, diet. yeah. Yeah. What would you cook with then fog. for um, avocado oil? Okay. It's Even that can go okay hot? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah that, that can go hot and obviously butter. Big okay. friend of mine, love Me butter, too. love the stuff. The French were right. <laughs> <laughs> I was raised on Vitalite, so I think that probably caused a few <laughs> issues. Uh, yeah. Wow, wow. Okay, top three, Christian, go. Uh, well, you know, this is obviously going to be one of them, right? You know? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You'd be all disappointed if it wasn't, right? Uh, well, reducing artificial light in the evening is a big one. Routine is very underestimated. The first thing I get people to do when trying to help them take back control of their life is to just generate a routine. This reduces stress levels so much and it also has many impacts that relate to these as well with the yeah. circadian rhythm. And I guess the third one would be um, actually just a big breakfast. You know, um, fundamentally a lot of people's health problems actually revolve around their inability to eat first thing in the morning. Now, lots of people will do intermittent fasting mm -hmm. and, uh, and then they'll decide to skip breakfast, for example, but because that's the, the hardest that's okay. the hardest one to, to eat. Actually, how we process food when the, day, when the sun is up, that's how we process food when the sun is down is completely different. Now, the longer you have to work the correct way of processing food within the daytime, the more benefits you'll get from those food. So eating later in the day, while it's not going to suddenly make you fat or unhealthy if you eat late at night right before bed, it does have an effect. And, a, and the later you start your day of eating, and the, or the later you finish your day of eating, the less benefits you can actually get from that food. So getting the routine and making sure that you know, I've got a good, a good breakfast, a good start to the day to allow my body to start using those resources as quickly and as early as possible in my day. I'm like the opposite the on that. Chair. I did the absolute <laughs> opposite. <laughs> yeah, I'd probably have to be forced. But, you know, what is it? 30 days to create a habit, 90 days to sustain it. Yep. Um, Sue, so sleep. Sleep, okay. Sleep. Sleep. Yep. Was that <laughs> yours? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. We're going to have three. Sleep. <laughs> Don't steal it. We all steal it. Sleep movement. I work from home. My commute is from upstairs to downstairs, and I find myself sitting an awful lot. So movement during the day, not just the high-intensity exercise, but getting up often during the day. And for me, it's a low carb diet. I just okay. do better on low carbs. Okay. Yeah. Great. Right. Keep so it simple. <laughs> to us. Keep it simple. Fundamentals. So everything that connects you with your natural environment. So movement is one. Sunlight is one. Um, sleep, obviously. But sleep was the f second one. <laughs> but as a, as as a third one, I would say again, this being engaged in your own journey towards your health is very important. And for this, you need to connect with your own biology. Because otherwise, you're not going to be very engaged. You're going to follow trends that don't necessarily work for you. And once you engage, then it's an infinite game of optimization. And you relate every day to it. And it's very exciting. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to say the M word that Davinia is not a fan of. Meditation, for me. Yes. I think it's um, yeah, twice a day, every day. Um, Community, being with people yes. that we've all missed, huge, huge. I think probably top of the top of the wellness um, list to be with other humans, fundamental interact, yeah. um, and nature. Absolutely, totally. Even if you're just gazing out the window at it, yep. but just engage. We are nature, so we need to engage more. Um, wonderful. Right. I think these lovely people want to ask some questions. Yeah, what I was going to suggest, um, rather than run around with microphones in this room and also for time, if you would like to ask a question, just pop your hand up and it would be great if you could say your name um, and how you fit into the Omnos family as a practitioner, a journalist, uh, 
influence of whichever. So uh, please feel free to have a round about 10 minutes until food and drink. I've not eaten. I'm not eaten, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> anyway, we can talk fast. Two seconds. <laughs> Do you know on your phone you can speed up a message? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. One point five, yeah. yeah. They're quite so slow like speakers. Speed, speed, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sam, yes. 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 So um, I'm Samantha from Booty. I met Thomas a year ago. We're going to do a yeah, year ago. I'm fascinated about the breakfast debate because <laughs> I haven't had breakfast this morning. I've been in my life intermittent fasting. I think I should eat before 12, and I'm starving and I'm angry. So is it a genealogy thing, which would mean I should or shouldn't have breakfast, or is there a one size fits all about breakfast? My question. Well, I think I, I'll start from a, from just like a, a woman's point of view. I sort of intermittent fast, but I don't do a calorie fast. So I add fats into my coffee, almost like a, a like a, a, a Dave Asprey thing. Yeah. So so I find myself fueling okay with fat right the way through the day, which does because as soon as I eat, I trigger something in my addictive brain that means I cannot stop. And if I start savoury, I'm going to finish strong with something sweet. So before I know it, I've had a load of carbohydrates and I'm shattered by two. So I save my carbohydrates till the evening, which sort of like kicks off serotonin, kicks off melatonin. Then I'm all cosy in bed in like Sleepy. a little carb coma, which I love. So that's how I've made the it sauna. work for me. Have yeah. you fallen asleep in the sauna, that have you? That yeah, my good. husband did, actually. I'm that boring. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> God, he's asleep. I love it. But yeah, that, that's what I do. So I don't yeah. eliminate calories. I don't do water fasting or anything. I do sort of like a fat fast throughout the morning because I hate hangry as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm naturally hangry all the time. So <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. But I think it's up to you and how you, yeah. how your stresses so, yeah. go. I, mean, I do the bulletproof coffee as well. But is there a genealogy thing? Is there a genetic? Yes, you're, you're, genes, you're like for me, intermittent fasting works very well because I'm predisposed to this type 2 diabetes thing, so regulating my insulin um, in the morning and being more metabolically flexible is a good thing for me. But then again, is where you are now, and if you have thyroid issue, you shouldn't do that, for example. So it's all about understanding where you are now, what is, you know, is it good for you? Because yeah, intermittent fasting is a trend, but it's not for everybody. And if you feel that it doesn't work for you, well, maybe you need to investigate why understand the why and maybe adapt it your way, right? Um, yeah. I don't think one size fits all in anything, not from dresses, no. not no. from no. diets. Real unique, very unique, very complex. Yeah, I, yeah. I would say definitely stay away from any one size fits all mentalities for anything, you know, realistically. There are definite genetic components would suggest if you are more or less likely to benefit from early breakfast, late breakfast, those sorts of things, intermittent fasting. Generally, the reason why I suggest people do intermittent fasting by cutting out dinner rather than breakfast is because the whole point is around creating autophagy, so the recycling <laughs> of cells, which happens naturally during sleep. So again, it's about optimizing when processes are meant to happen. The reason why I have my beliefs, and I've got research, of course, to why, the reasons why I think certain things. Um, it's also to do with the way your body utilizes protein, so how you build things, your, what we call anabolic processes, are much more likely to happen during the uh, day, or your catabolic process is more likely to happen during the evening. You know? So catabolic breaking down, anabolic building up. So the earlier you have those resources in the system, because, let's face it, a large portion of general population are depleted of resources, whether that be amino acids, whether that be vitamins, whether that be minerals, something is not there that needs to be there. And it's not just about, the, re the reason why most people are overweight is because they consume too much energy but not enough resources. Mm -hmm. So resources are those micronutrients. The energy is, say, your calories. So if you've got tons of, tons of energy, tons of calories, but you've got no resources, you've got no way of using that energy. Mm -hmm. So what do you think your body's gonna do? It's just gonna stick it in your fat cells. And hey, presto. And really quickly, yep. Christian, and I know it's really difficult to make your, your brain <laughs> nutshell things down, but metabolic, and genetic, how do they differ in the res results? I mean, do they, are they, obviously they're compatible, but would they, because I have found, I mean, I love a sauna, but a traditional Chinese medicine doctor who I really rate, I love the TCM system, I think it's really interesting, that, oh no, you shouldn't sweat, because mm -hmm. you'll, really, you'll really lose your chi. Mm. And you've okay. got a certain amount of chi, and you can't replace it, so don't lose, I'm kind of, oh, I love a sauna. Yeah. What about my chi? <laughs> now I'm worried about my chi. Do I sauna? Well, do I lose my chi? You know, so how does I, how do I, we I, do this? I, 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 oh, God. Infrared, maybe. I, I would yeah. describe genes as risk factors. You yep. know, uh, 
where you look at standard biology, like when you do some of the other tests that are more looking at functional aspects right now, it's seeing whether those risk factors are being expressed or not. So, so you're, you show the machines... Yeah, this is the... What you, the you machine's labelling, and you make the she, machine work better. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, you could be you're missing a part that makes a, makes a certain job harder, or you could have an extra part that makes a certain job easier. You know, but that doesn't mean that you're going to suffer, depending on how any of you have walked through your life. You know, we're all made of very similar stuff. Like, our genetics are very, very similar. Very, very minute changes make people individuals. Mm -hmm. And we all have the same arms, legs, you know, bits and pieces to put us together. But how we have experienced life from the moment of our birth, even before our birth, in fact, from the moment of absolute conception to this point now is entirely unique. And that's what makes you a unique mm. individual that's and a person. Yeah. So and it's more to do with how things are operating sort of yeah, thing, yeah, right now. Yeah, we need an epigenetics test. Yeah. <laughs> but what about the ancestry? Because, I mean, you said you had a lovely childhood, which, you yeah. know, but no trauma. Uh, but then you, some people might say, oh, she was, when you went through your difficult years, oh, she's just got trauma. But no. No, I know. So maybe I mean, it was yeah. um, ancestral. Have you, do you, I mean, the ancestry comes out in... <laughs> Yes, we'll be, the, I mean, we'll the, be the expressing genes from your, our it's predecessors. Your, your genetic, right? Yeah. Um, but yes, the, to, to come back to what you know, Christian was so, saying, is, is your genetic is the make of you, but on the other test is whether or not this you are expressing now. And combining the two is very powerful because it's showing you, like, yes, you're predisposed, let's say, to dementia, and yes, you have all the things that could trigger this long term right now. Um, in, in, in those tests, like other tests, like you know, looking at other things like insulin sensitivity, looking at toxins, all those factors that accelerate those gene to express. And this is what is powerful because you know what your priorities are and you know what's going on right now. So I need to change what's going on right now to prevent this to develop long term. Yeah, right? and with all, all those extra little marginal things you're saying to, to get from here to there. There's, yeah. you know, so many spots to, to walk exactly. across. Exactly. And, and that's the exciting bit because this is where you are in control. You can switch on and not those genes to express or not by what you're doing on a daily basis. So at the end, you are the architect of your health and this Absolutely. is the exciting thing. I, I See what you started, <laughs> Sam, asking about breakfast? I think we're going to, before, <laughs> before we need to get... With a question and then the lady at the end, and I'm just keeping an eye on yes. the time. Yes. Hi, I'm Ryan Nell. Uh, I'm the founder of Levitate. It's a, it's a meditation and well-being company. Thomas and I met, what, a year and a half? A year and a half ago. Your challenge is to get this woman meditating. I'm <laughs> <laughs> putting down the gauntlet, yeah. okay? Okay, amazing. Speak to me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my question is really about, uh, well, we did a great Instagram live about um, science and meditation if you're interested. It was the first yeah. live, yes. so I get yeah. the most peaceful guy I could start. <laughs> 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 right. it was like anyway, nice. It was very patient. <laughs> So my, my question is really about, uh, it's pretty banal, um, it's about, about trust. So, so you've got Theranos um, and that whole story over in the States, and you know, it's, a, uh, it's a kind of interesting thing about how do you get the public yep. class worrying about the quality of the data and how the data's going to be looked after, but also, um, so the second part, how do you get doctors to trust the results of the consumer test, because I would love to be able to kind of take my honest results to, to my GP. Don't do that. It's <laughs> <laughs> only got a 10 minute appointment. I think it's... It, how, do we kind of, how do we get there? It's self-regulation, right? So in the sense that um, we only report, you could, we could report to thousands and thousands of genes, but actually out of a thousand, a very few are really well documented. And we make sure that the one we report on are really well documented and make sure that we attach. Like if you go on the platform, you have the science, you have all the description and then you have the scientific paper attached to it. So it's all uh, here, transparent. And it's a very important thing to do because we need to position as notoriety in a new thing, right? And, and something we're really strong at and, and we have uh, we make sure to have people around us in terms of the, the advisory board and else to make sure they actually tell us what to do or not to do to make sure we, we are going in the right direction on, on, on Who's that. Who's the advisory board, Thomas? Who makes up that, that board? So we have many people Obviously on the ben. advisory board. I'm not on the advisory board. No. Oh, no. Yeah. So it's independence. Well, one of the, one of the things that we, uh, there are two answers to your question. One of the things, you know that none of the doctors would dispute that these are medical tests. They're all ISO 25, so doctors use them themselves, but they use them for critical illness. 
yeah. where they would say the difficulty is, have we simplified the results? Mm, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because a doctor would come back and say, well, if you really want these results, it's going to have to tell you everything, which is 15 pages. And actually, as an end user, you think, oh my god, I don't understand the word that. You, can you not tell it to me in three sentences? And the answer is, mm. they can't. So the criticism that they would have of us is, is that we try to simplify it to make it democratise. There's a balance in that. Yeah. Cri Christian, mm -hmm. for we don't like breaking the dogma. This is what we do. <laughs> Christian, on the one hand, is trying to make things very scientific. On the other hand, the people like me on the board, you say, yeah, I understand that. You, like start, you start to use a word that has more than 20 letters in it. <laughs> 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 so we will make sure to have this hierarchy in place as the well. The second thing is um, doctors themselves. I mean, I once advised a company called Optos. And Optos invented a machine to test for diabetes. And we had a business plan that said every doctor in the country, of course, will want to know if you've got diabetes or not at an early stage. It's about 20 years ago. No doctor ever bought an optician machine. <laughs> and yet every optician in the country has an optos machine. Mm. When you go to the optician, you get tested. Because doctors just aren't, haven't the time or the inclination to be able to do it. And it's not none of their fault. It's just the system isn't set up. So, so you asked the question about where you see the future on this. I can actually see that. For wellness, it may well be the nutritionists and the, um, and the dietitians and uh, enlightened um, uh, uh, trainers, sports trainers, who actually are the ones who are advising us on health. Yeah, well, you know, the cornerstone, and they always have done. And the platform, obviously. Nutrition, I mean, the cornerstone of health is what you eat, really. So, I mean, it really is. But you asked another question on, so the trust we covered, and I just, Sue, maybe you can answer about... I know that the data is not necessarily in terms of Omnos data and what they're doing with that. Could you wanted to know a little bit about how can we make sure our data has not been sold to Big Pharma in 20 years kind of thing. Is that what you're getting at? Oh, no, no. It's more how do you get past consumer fear of the data. Okay. I, mean, I, I don't know how well known the Theranos story is. Who, it's a crazy you're, story. You're talking about the, the genetics company that basically was a bit of a bust. They, they, did, that, yeah, yes. did, yeah, they got, uh, yeah, they got sent to jail and all sorts of stuff for basically doing dodgy things. Yes. yes. Uh, look, you know, validation. Mm. Like I said before, it's like you, you create the clarity, you create the, you create the transparency of what we're doing, and we get enough data through the system from the ground up to be able to put it through proper validation steps. Now, while everything we're drawing from is coming from originally validated scientific evidence that's out there. We're drawing many, from many different places, putting it together in one place for you to try and simplify these complex subjects. And while it's coming from validated sources, the amalgamation of it is not validated in itself. And that is the point where we start to get through that. So once we get that validation step out of the way and it's then trusted by larger bodies, then it brings on the tr a greater level of trust of mass consumers as well. So it's like, uh, trying to figure out which step is first, right? You know, validation or, or, or consumer okay. trust. Just, just put good people. Yeah. Good so people will spread good news. I mean, yeah, that's, it's, that's it's, it's public it's awareness, it's isn't it? And like the amount of people who say, well, you can have your DNA tested, what I can get a hormone mm -hmm. test, what I can find out what minerals I'm. I mean, people are lit. I mean, like you said, well educated people who buy into the health phenomenon literally have no idea about that this information is accessible it's affordable you don't have to go to the bloody lands and yeah you yeah. know for and spend, nice and i know it's nice but <laughs> spend, drop 20 grand you know you can do this at home oh, and you well I, I actually didn't go but that's my ex-husband but um no literally you can do a blood test and you've got actionable actionable information yeah. that will work immediately there's no transfers there's no hotels there's nothing it's there in your home and that I think is where the power and that's where the conversation about the centralizing yeah it's the storytelling though you know and we'll talk about it and of course I'm going to talk about that as a journalist but you know the difficult thing is you know going back to the, the headlines you know it's we've got to go further than the headline because you know I'll, and I think we talked about this you can write in fact actually uh, put a piece in the Times recently on meditation um, Vedic meditation with a very good practitioner has written a fantastic book so we did a great story and they ran with it which was great because I've been trying to do the woo-woo at the Times for a long time um, and, um, and of course the headline was the £2,000 guru for meditation now actually she, they charge depending on your income 
So they're far from an elitist type of meditation. So we've got to get past the headlines and we've got to tell the story really well. And um, it's been all a good of you've got to tell the story. Didn't read any news. <laughs> <laughs> For that reason, right? Well, I know, but you know, that's the problem with all sorts of studies. You know, they get put into the head and it's the headline. You've got to get people re reading it all the way down to the bottom. So that's where we're going with that. I think there was one more. Um, yeah, my, my mantra is can we get the Vino? It's a, a vague. <laughs> 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 You're not supposed to tell your mantra. <laughs> Why actually you had a you. quick question and now you've got time um, for one more. Super quick my question actually. Hi, I'm Helen. I, um, I've been following on this journey through our biohacking community. And my question is for you, um, Thomas. Um, I've, been, I've been doing a lot of testing on myself it's because I have my own, I've been suffering a lot of health issues over the years, um, very bad ones. And this is how I got to um, biohacking and all of that. Mm. Um, very interested in the trying your tests. Now, what about the results? Because I've done a lot of testing in the past, and I know it comes with a consultation afterwards, mm -hmm. but is it easy for me to understand the results? Um, because yeah. we haven't seen it in an example what actually the result looks like. When, yeah. when so this, 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 this is coming back to what we, the way we decided to work on this for, for a long time, is to have a hierarchy from the top expert that talks in his language uh, and sometimes you cannot understand. To underne underneath someone who understands it to translate in something a bit more mild. And then we call it omnisifying, which is the omnisifying process within Omnos. It's about making it accessible to everyone. So there's all those levels. And on the platform, you can dig in to all those levels. Uh, the amazing team of uh, developers here, uh, um, Dan is here, uh, has been working a lot on that, on making this really user-friendly to the point that you can really dig into the precise gene and what it means and the complexity of it, but also get the simple recommendation on what you should, do be, do should be doing about it. And that is Im this important hierarchy within Omnos that actually makes things a lot more easy, easy to access. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Life codex, um, DNA testing, yeah. for example, which is brilliant if you get proper consultation after, but for myself to understand, just yeah. like go back and read it again, over and over again. It it's, it's all hard to understand, but you, 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 you still have that within the Omnos platform in the sense that you will, if you do an hormone test, you will have the report. Mm -hmm. But if you look at just the report of the hormone test, you really need to be qualified to understand it. Mm -hmm. And what we worked really hard is to translate of this uh, from the report itself, uh, with the people who've created the report, to all the way up to, you know, things you can take home. Thomas, can and you just remind implement. us as well on that? Do you get a call with someone? Yes, you have a 15 you minute consultation. But uh, after this, is, is, is there a follow up call, or is that when you implement your functional doctors? Yeah, in you, the you can have a follow up call, and then um, amazing practitioner like you, if something needs to be more clinical and you already have issue and you want to discuss, you can also book consultation and it's something that's going to be released within weeks. So, yeah. I mean, I know you don't want to be pointing things out to have this because of the sustainability, but I do, and I think we talked about this as well, about, you know, that we're so tech obsessed and tech heavy, which I have a massive, you know, I think that will be our next... Um, <laughs> issue, which is what Anola means, online alpha, and later just said, because it's going to be another juggling act, but it, you know, it's, it's almost like being able to have a notepad with your results, so you can scribble notes down, go back to your, you know, I think maybe we can, maybe there's some more of that needs to be put in, so it's not just all screen-based. Yeah, it's not all screen-based, and I mean, Omnos 2.0 as well is very exciting what's coming up, because it's all about the top priority, so you, you have a lot less to navigate, and this is what really counts for you now. And if you really want to dig, you can, but this is a top priority for you. Well, let's book the 50th anniversary <laughs> soon yeah. so that we can really guarantee we believe in our ownership of our own healthcare so yeah. much that we're going to book a 50th anniversary. Anyone, I mean, yeah. these pr probably should get free tickets, right? Even though it might be in Mars. You'll be there. Might be in Mars or well, if you follow us, you'll surely be there anyway. We'll have you. So, um, <laughs> Thomas, can I just ask you one question? Yeah. This lady's bought um, a LifeCode DX DNA test, I assume. Mm -hmm. Would that be able to be integrated with the Omnos? Would she be able they to use it? have to accept that. Yeah, but yeah. obviously it's something we want to do in the sense that we have a system that, for example, Dutch test, yeah. which is a very common test, mm -hmm. can yeah. be uploaded to our platform yeah. and our platform translate that. So 
we want to be open source because I don't believe in the fragmented industry. Yeah, that's that's not that anywhere. Yeah. We need to be, if you really want to change what we want to do, democratize health, we need to work together towards exactly. the same goal. Yeah, exactly. Right? It's all about There's community. enough cu customers on the planet yes. think that's yeah. to share around. Yeah, it's, yeah. 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 It, um, it's, it's about getting the other companies to work with us. And that, yeah. that takes time to develop those relationships. Yeah. I mean, like your, G, your GX code, uh, code uh, DNA test will have a different system of how it's presented and therefore for our system to mm. automatically pick it up takes a bit of work. So eventually, yes, hopefully, yeah, we'll actually get that relationship going. But uh, for now, it's uh, we'll, I, the general things you get from testing with us is not only the results of the test, but what you should do about it, the yeah. interventions that come after it. That's the thing that realistically you're asking about. I think. And, the and continuing the journey, tests. continuing yeah. Yeah. together. Yeah. 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 Mm. Do I have salt or do I not have salt? Just yeah. tell me. Right, okay, I'm off. Yeah, I Pink get it. salt. <laughs> Pink um, salt. You would ask me to be bold about yes. time. So yep. I'm uh, stepping forward bold. and doing that. Um, so just really on behalf of uh, Omnos, I just wanted to say, and if they have any other questions, these guys I know are going to be here. Um, forgive me for keeping it to time, but um, thank you for sharing your stories, for taking part, for actually coming this evening rather than thinking you should do it at home. It was great to have you here, and I hope you can just join me briefly in thanking uh, Thomas, Sue, uh, Christian, uh, Davinia, and of course, Suzanne. In the middle, I think a round of applause. <laughs>